Uh, thanks uh, for everyone for joining us. Today, we're gonna talk about your ITE exam for both internal medicine and family medicine. Um, so we'll go through some of the specifics and some tips and tricks about how to, how to do well on this exam. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mike Wren. I'm um, an assistant professor of family medicine, board certified, of course. Um, I'm at Baylor in Houston, Texas, and uh, I'm also a tutor at Med School Tutors. Yeah, and I, I should also mention I'm, uh, I'm also at Columbia in New York City. So uh, first of all, just to give you a little background about who we are at Med School Tutors. So we provide one-on-one -on -one online tutoring um, from pre-med all the way through residency and boards. Uh, we have 15 plus years of student successes. I, I myself have been working for Med School Tutors uh, for going on six, almost seven years now. Um, and there's tons of, of uh, experience here. We've got residents, attendings like Mike and I, uh, fellows who've all done really, really well on their exams uh, and they're absolutely passionate about teaching. Uh, so they're really good at what they do. We're really good at what we do. For sure, for sure. And I think one good thing, at least um, from, from you know, my perspective is you kind of learn best from those who are closest to you in training. So, you know, if I just took the MCAT a couple of years ago, then, you know, you probably want to be, um, you know, have a tutor who just took it, not someone who's, you know, 10 years out, 20 years out, something like that. Um, some things we'll cover today just in this webinar um, are study and timeline tips. Uh, we know it's difficult in residency to kind of find and create um, time, you know, free time, just and let alone time to study. Um, also, I know some of you watching this have already taken the ITE or um, previously. So using those scores, using that score report as a guide um, for your future ITs and, of course, ultimately for your boards. Um, Eric and I will be going over some high yield family medicine and internal medicine resources. Uh, there's more than just you world. Um, and then, of course, we're here to answer any questions you guys may have. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so just generally specialty independent tips. So it doesn't matter if you're an internist or a family medicine physician. Um, so from your first year of residency through the last year. So it's, it's, it's a continuum, right? So I always tell people, especially people who I'm uh, tutoring for either the ITE or their, their internal medicine board exam, their ABIM board exam, uh, to adjust expectations. Because like Mike was saying, residency is super busy. It's really hard to just find time to you know, do your laundry and your regular everyday errands, let alone actually study. Um, so you're probably not going to have hours upon hours of studying like when you were studying for step one or the MCATs. And starting early is really key. A lot of people will delay studying because they're, you know, I don't have the time uh, and I'll worry about boards, I'll worry about ITE later and they save it to the last minute and then find out that that's a huge mistake because there's ton you can't cram three years of a residency into a few months. Um, limit your resources because again, with, with board exams, there's tons of resources out there, some better than others. And it sometimes feels necess necessary to, you know, get as many get many resources as possible because you talk to a bunch of different friends. They all recommended a bunch of different things. So you feel compelled to use them all, but try to limit them because too many can become very overwhelming. And utilize your lighter rotations. So when you're on an outpatient block, when you're on an elective block, even when you're on vacation, you're not inundated with you know maybe a busy inpatient month or an ICU month to start to study a little bit more. So some, um, one of the, like the high yield resource is uh, definitely gonna be UWorld, although there are others. Um, I'm sure many of you have used it before. It's a QBank, there's like thousands of questions. Um, Eric, I'm not sure for internal medicine, how many do y'all have? Like for family medicine, I think we have 15, 1600 questions um, for the UWorld board exam. Yeah, it's about the same for the UWorld and, and with MixApp and the other major study, uh, question bank, it's about the same, another yeah. 1500 questions. Yeah, so that's a lot of questions to get through. Um, some tips to kind of help you get through all of them is to kind of group your questions, reading, studying into particular patient cases. So if you're on inpatients and for some reason you have a lot of cirrhotic patients, maybe do the GI section. Um, that's kind of a helpful hint because it'll help you with your wards, um, maybe with patient management. And then you can really uh, kind of st get that stuck in your brain of how to manage cirrhotic cases and uh, things associated with cirro cirrhosis. Um, another thing also is, I know for family medicine, we do uh, 
bunch of different rotations on different specialties. So, you know, if you're on an ophthalmology rotation, you can do the ophthalm, you can do some questions about, about eyes. If you're on your peds inpatient rotation, uh, you can knock out all of your pediatric questions. Um, one thing definitely to kind of take note of is uh, any red flags. One of them is that if you have, if you've struggled with standardized tests before, and by now you should know whether you fit into that category or not, um, just because we've taken, I don't know, like about a dozen <laughs> standardized exams. I mean, step one, step two, step three, things like that. So if you struggle with those in the past, um, you should really, like Eric was mentioning, start early, but also have a study plan and stick to it. Yeah, and I think I think it's really, really important, like Mike was saying, to try to compartmentalize your studying, especially if your residency has specialty rotations. If you're in the ICU, just do critical care when you're studying, because again, it kills two birds with one stone. You look really good on rounds because you know the management of ARDS, and you're you're learning and preparing for boards at the same time. So, um, you know, like Mike was saying, some of you probably already taken your ITEs. It depends on, you know, where, where in residency you're going. Some, some residencies make you take ITEs every year, others maybe just the second or third year. Um, but if you've already taken your ITEs, they're actually a, a really good tool to help you in the future prepare for board exams. Um, and it's, they're really there to help you. They're not there to sort of you know, make you worry that, oh gosh, I have to take another test in the middle of residency, it's such a pain in the butt, but it actually is really, really good um, in terms of helping you prepare for boards and beyond. So use it, it gives you a very detailed breakdown in your score report based upon not, not just subject matter like cardiology, but like arrhythmias and, and, and congestive heart failure and specific parts of uh, the major organ systems that you need work on. So, you know, break down your, um, your USMLE or sorry, your, your PGY years into, um, into sort of uh, these learning modules, right? So for PGY one, learning the basics of medicine and acknowledging red flags. So again, as an intern, it's really, you know, you're, you're basically just trying to keep your head above water. So, you know, try to get the basics down, obviously learning the nuances, the finer details and management may be a little bit more difficult. Um, addressing your gaps in knowledge, because by the time you transition to your second year of residency, you should know which things you were good at, which things might have been a little bit more difficult for you in terms of even the rotations that you were on. And then as you're a PGY3, you know, you're assuming that team leadership role, you're a little bit more comfortable at, uh, as a resident using your prior ITE scores to really hammer down those problem areas, saying, I knew on my last ITE, I was really struggling with cardiology. I know whenever I'm on a CARDS rotation, I have trouble with EKGs. I have trouble with management of cardiogenic shock. So I want to focus on that and use it to your advantage. Yeah, for sure. So kind of like um, what Eric was saying, what I was saying, one of those red flags uh, to note is if you have a history of struggling with standardized tests, be it test anxiety, um, if you know your fund of knowledge just isn't there, um, or if you just have like uh, any sort of like performance anxiety, like, oh my God, you, you know, you do fine on the Q banks, you do fine on the AFP questions or the mixed up questions. But when it comes to test day, you're like, holy crap, this is a big test um, and you just struggle. You need to kind of realize that and work to uh, mitigate, mitigate those stresses. Um, something else that's a red flag to note is uh, if you have any of your, so again, some of you guys may not take ITE in your first year, but if you have um, any ITEs where you scored below the quarter percentile, so if you score less than um, those who did in the 25th percentile, that's definitely a red flag. I know for um, the American Board of Family Medicine, we have something called like the Bayesian predictor tool. Basically, you put in your step one, step two scores, and you put in your uh, ITE score based on your um, based on your residency year. So if you're like a PGY two, you should be at you should be scoring I don't know maybe like a 400 or something. And based on that, it'll give you a percentage um, of whether or not you'll pass the boards. So that's a really useful tool. And if if that number is below, I would say 90th 90th percentile, that's another red flag to look out for. Uh, most people should be well above 90, um, ideally in like the 95th 99th percentile. Um, and that's, I would say, a fairly accurate predictor. Um, some other things to note and look out for is if you're, if you're really struggling uh, or have a lack of familiarity with concepts that are discussed in, um, we, we had weekly conferences at my residency, but um, 
during didactics or on wards, or you, you know, you're listening to grand rounds or something, and uh, you're just really not getting something. You ask your classmates, and then they explain it to you. That happening once or twice is fine. Uh, nobody is going to know everything, especially for uh, primary care. It's just so broad uh, the things we do have to know. So that's fine. But if you constantly find yourself struggling or constantly find yourself uh, asking for clarification, that's something to look out for. And of course, um, at my residency, I think at most residencies, you have uh, an annual or semi-annual uh, evaluation with your PD or your APD. And they'll kind of talk to you like, hey, I've noticed, or maybe other faculty have noticed um, that you struggled with pediatric topics, or maybe you struggled with OBGYN topics. Um, that's definitely helpful as well. And that can kind of uh, turn you in the right direction in terms of, okay, this is what I need to work on. Yeah, absolutely. And I, at least in my program, I'm, I'm also one of the APDs for the internal medicine program at Columbia. And, you know, we meet biannually with our, with our residents and oh, the ACGME milestones um, are fed by the evaluations that you get on your, your ward rotations. And three of them are medical knowledge based. And if you have issues in the medical knowledge uh, milestones as you, during your evaluations, that's another sort of red flag to say, okay, I need to really focus on, um, on my net medical knowledge. And a lot of times your program itself, sorry, there's a, there's a ambulance going by outside. Um, so a lot of times your program, if you score poorly on the ITE, will say, listen, we need to come up with a reading plan to make sure that you know, you'll, you'll get back on track. Because again, doing poorly on the ITE is a red flag that you won't do well on your, on your actual board exam. So, Okay, so some common mistakes to avoid. So we sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, you do not want to wait until it's too late um, to study. Now with ITE, it's a lot of programs will say, you know, it's hard to study for ITE. You just sort of go in and sort of assesses your knowledge on the spot. If you were to take the board exam uh, on this day, how would you do? So it's more of a, I use it as more of a, a, di a diagnostic tool to sort of see where you where you are, which areas need trouble. Um, but when you're looking forward to your board exams, obviously you don't want to wait until the end of PGY3. At least for internal medicine, your board exams happen at the August after you graduate PGY3, after you graduate residency. Obviously, don't take on too much too fast. Again, you're gonna you're working 80 hours a week, so trying to put you know, 20 hours of studying on top of that, obviously it's not going to be sustainable. You need to take care of yourself. Um, you need to, you know, do your everyday errands, you need to do your everyday activities. So studying is also going to have to fit into that. Pace yourself. It's a marathon. It's definitely not a sprint. You've got three years. So take it slowly. Don't be too hard on yourself. I find, I found this was difficult for me because um, you feel like you have to do everything. You have to balance everything. You have to, you know, go to the gym. You have to eat right. You have to take care of your family. You have to work and you have to study. But again, it's going to be hard to find time to just sit down and study during residency. Some days are going to be easier than others. And you're going to realize that, you know, after a busy rotation, a long call in the ICU, the last thing you want to do when you get home is study. So you'll just say, okay, I, you know, I know I'm, I'm in the ICU this month. It's going to be not a great month for studying. And you're going to have to be okay with that. You're going to have to forgive yourself and say, you know what, I next month I'm on an ambulatory block or I'm an elective. I'll get a lot of studying done then. For sure. And I think um, equally important to finding time to study is finding time to kind of treat yourself, um, you know, have dinner with friends, go watch the movie, go get a massage, whatever you enjoy. Um, that'll be important. And you can kind of do a reward system or, you know, you, you, you guys have studied uh, for step long enough to know um, what works and what doesn't. So if you want to do, you know, maybe this weekend I'm studying, but next weekend I'm going to go hang out with my friends or go out. I think that's very reasonable. Um, this slide is just about planning kind of for your PGY3 your final year of residency. Uh, by now you should have already an outline of how you're going to study. Um, you should have already taken an ITE and gotten that score report back. Uh, you should have already had multiple meetings with your PD or APD and everyone's Everyone in your residency program wants you to succeed. So don't be afraid to reach out to them, ask like, hey, you know, I'm really, I know I'm really struggling with this topic. Um, are there any resources? Um, that's kind of the first bullet point of this. You need to make sure you know your baseline and uh, that's, that's where you start from. Um, definitely having a study calendar. I myself didn't have, I wasn't so, I guess I, I wasn't as regimented. I didn't have a study calendar, but I knew that, you know, uh, roughly by what month, like, okay, by August, I want to have this amount done. 
by September, I want to have this amount done. So it was month to month for me. It wasn't really day to day. I don't know if it was similar for you, Eric. Or... Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I didn't have an exact calendar planned out, but again, I sort of had my, my mix app, which is the question bank I use, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but I sort of had, I wanted to get this many questions done by the end of the month or, you know, I yeah. want, it was, it was, again, it was hard to say, I want to get, you know, a hundred questions done in a day because days could be extraordinarily variable. So maybe one day I would get a hundred questions done and another day I wouldn't get any done, but I just sort of had a general idea. Um, and I think, you know, at, at MST, we're pretty good at getting people who, who really benefit from a regimented calendar on that track. Yeah, for sure. So what works for you? If you need a daily calendar, like, oh, I need to have, you know, 27 questions done, 54 questions done by Tuesday, um, then that's fine. But um, if you don't want to be so, if you want to be a little bit more flexible, that works too. Um, that kind of brings me into my next point. Be realistic. Uh, you know, uh, saying, oh, I'm going to have 150 year old questions and their explanations like done, read through, memorized uh, by next week or by, you know, two days from now. Um, that's setting like unrealistic goals is not going to be super helpful because then once you don't meet those goals, you're going to feel down and maybe you won't want to move to the next step. So set the realistic goals. Once you get them, you can feel good about yourself and move on and continue because um, that's what this is all about. Uh, it's a long-term thing. It's not something you're going to get done with, uh, you know, a month or even a year. The residency, at least for us, is three years, um, and medicine is kind of a lifelong learning process. Definitely choose, um, choose some time to, uh, and set aside some time and money to get the resources that you need. So Eric and I will talk about some resources um, other than UWorld that you can, you can use to study. Um, just make sure you have a little bit of money because some of them, I know you rolled is expensive and there are some books out there that are like 50, hundred bucks. Uh, but you know, at least as a resident, you're getting paid. Uh, and then the last thing is definitely communicate with your other, your co-residents, um, those who have graduated core faculty, your PD, APD, because again, everyone wants you to succeed. So if you're struggling with something or if they see you struggling with something, um, don't be afraid to communicate that. Uh, uh, it doesn't make you sound weak or anything. Um, everyone's there to help you succeed. Everyone wants you to pass. Yeah, and I think- We want I you think, to pass too. Exactly. I think that goes, <laughs> that, that deserves to be highlighted is that uh, I think asking for help is a sign of strength, not of weakness. So if you realize I'm, I'm having trouble with this, that's, that's, that shows that you're, you know, you're introspective enough to realize and self-evaluate and say, this is, this is something I need help with um, rather than just sort of sit with it and struggle with it on your own and, you know, wind the wind up not doing well in your IT, but also, you know, wind up making a, a patient error because you don't understand a, a specific topic. So I think it's, it's always, I always appreciate when residents come up to me and say, Hey, you know, I'm having trouble with X, Y, and Z and asking for certain tips and pointers. So sure. some resources for, uh, for ABIM, so that's the, uh, the American Board of Internal Medicine, uh, which is, again, the same resources that you would use to prep for ABIM is the same thing you would use to prep for your, your in-training exam as well, because again, it's just sort of a in-training exam as like a baby version of the ABIM. So what I use, and I feel like a lot of internal medicine residents use is MixApp, um, which uh, some residency programs actually provide you with, others, you know, you have to, you have to buy it on your own, which is a little expensive. Um, but essentially it's really good. I find it helpful because it's not only a question bank, but it's also a text series. Um, now some people can go and, you know, they'll get all these textbooks in addition to the, the Q bank. Uh, but most of it is, all of it is digital. So I, you know, I opted to not get all these books because there's, I think like 15 of them and there's, they take up way too much space. They're not actually pretty books to display on a bookshelf. So, um, I opted just for the digital version, which again is the Q bank. And it has all of the, the text, but in just digital format. You can put it on your iPad or your phone, which I found super helpful because even if I was on a busy rotation, like the ICU, and it was like in between admissions or it was overnight, things were a little bit quieter, I would say, okay, let me just knock out a few questions or let me just read because it's got the, the text on it. I'll read about ARDS or I'll read about septic shock. So on rounds, I could, you know, in the morning, I could look, I could look like I actually did something. Um, New England Journal has something very similar, New England Journal, Journal K+, which is uh, the knowledge series. Um, UWorld, like Mike was saying, I think, I think is uh, people like using UWorld because they're the most familiar with it because you've been using UWorld since you were babies in medical school and uh, you feel very familiar with that format. I think UWorld is a good uh, supplement to MixApp. 
uh, if you've gone through MixApp a couple of times, especially if you start early in your PGY one year and you go through MixApp like three times. And by the time you're a third year going through it again, you're like, I remember all these questions. You world is, uh, is pretty good. Um, Rosh Review, Med Challenger, and True Learner um, are also uh, other resources that are out there. I myself am not overly familiar with them because I think a lot of the students that I've worked with, a lot of the residents I work with in my residency program and myself have used MixApp and UWorld, but those are some options should you, uh, should you feel that you need to broaden your question bank. Nice. Yeah, I think we have some similar ones, some different. Um, one thing to mention definitely is don't, we're, we're suggesting all these, but don't feel like you have to use all of them. Uh, that, that would be a lot of resources. And that would be <laughs> like, I think way too many questions, but you do you. Um, if you want to do thousands, <laughs> uh, you know, questions upon questions, go ahead. Um, but for me, I think I would select uh, three or four of these, maybe yeah, two to four, and then really go from there. Um, so here I kind of have them um, broken down just in, in terms of years. So your first year, we have uh, AAFP questions. Uh, most residencies for family medicine um, give you, they kind of gift to you, uh, your AAFP membership. Otherwise, if not, I think uh, I, since I've graduated, I think it's like $60 now that I have to like pay out of my own pocket, but it's like a year. So it's not, it's not that bad. And ABFM also has questions. Um, I have AFP listed first because I think those questions are a little bit better. Uh, I've included them. I've included a few in this review, but the ABFM questions are a little bit too, the explanations are just a little bit too nuanced and detailed. And the AFP ones are just more straightforward. So for learning, I think that's really good because it'll, it'll help, um, you know, really punch key concepts across. Um, uh, second year, you want to continue with AFP questions. Again, they're free and there's, I don't know, I think like 16, 1700 of them. They come in sets of 10. Um, you can use books, videos. I know in my residency program, they offered like Med Challenger and another video learning resource, but the videos were like 30 minutes long. I, I didn't really watch them, but um, if that's how you learn, if you're a really visual learner, uh, for me, I learned just by doing a bunch of questions. But if you want full detailed explanation, the videos are a way to go for books. Um, I actually have a couple right here. Let me grab them. I feel like a lot of times books get recommended and then you're like, man, I bet this guy didn't even have that book. So here, let me. <laughs> oh. just prove that. So one of these is um, first aid for family medicine boards. This is kind of just like first aid for USNLD step one. You're used to it. It has a bunch of cases and uh, questions that go with those cases. And I like the layout of it. Uh, and then another one is this um, McGraw Hill. It's Wilbur's Family Medicine. This one has pretty good questions. I'm, to be honest, I haven't done all of them, um, but I know that they're pretty good. So if you like something physical um, to hold in your hands, to write on, to take notes on, um, those books I'd recommend. Um, the more expensive option, and I think honestly one of the better options uh, out of this list is UWorld. Um, the explanations are great for UWorld because they tell you not only why the question is correct or why the answer choice is correct, but also why all of the other answer choices are incorrect. And for family medicine, and I'm assuming for internal medicine as well, because of how broad it is, you really want to know why the other answer choices are incorrect. Um, third year, keep doing U World. You should hopefully finish up with your AAP questions by then. Um, consider, you know, review courses. Consider reaching out to us because this is really um, you, you're really coming down the stretch and boards are imminent. For us, we take it in April. I know for you guys, it's in August, uh, but we take it in April of our third year, so before you graduate. Um, so that's the review sources to consider. And then the last thing is to definitely go over your ITEs in the previous years. Um, and actually, for the for the family medicine boards, some of those questions are like paraphrased and then reused. <laughs> so, I mean, th there's only, you know, there's only so much medicine out there, right? There's gotta be repeats. So definitely go through those. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, using your ITEs as a guide, especially when you're getting closer and closer to your boards and you don't have a lot of time, you wanna triage the areas that you're weakest in. So using your ITEs to sort of guide that is, is super helpful. Um, so Mike and I actually have some practice questions, um, to sort of give you guys an idea of, um, what you're going to, what you're going to encounter on ITEs and on the board exam. I think Mike has three, I have two. Uh, so we'll go over these and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. Yeah. So we can just knock these out. Um, 
what I'll do, I'll just go ahead and read this one and then I'll wait for 30 seconds a minute. Uh, you can type, feel free to type it in the chat or if you're a little bit shy, just keep it, keep the answer choice you pick in your head. No switching, all right? Just like the real <laughs> test. Uh, and then we'll kind of go through the explanation. Uh, so number one, um, this is straight from the free question from AFP. Uh, so there are some short ones, some long ones. This happens to be a short one. So stretching has no uh, benefit for which of the following? Hamstring strain, neck pain, joint contracture, OA, or um, rehab post knee replacement. So just think about that one for a second, and then um, we can do we can go over the explanation. That was a short question. I think, I think people have had enough time. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. So the answer is C. I'm not going to read the entire explanation. Um, but actually, if you if you go back one slide, Eric, um, we can just I, we can just kind of demonstrate how we go go about answering these. Um, so even if you maybe don't know exactly the answer to this question, you can sort of by process of elimination really improve your chances. Um, so stretching, uh, like stretching PT, all that is uh, I group into one category. So after your after you get anything replaced, you definitely want to do some sort of PT stretching. So that kind of eliminates answer choice E. Uh, for OA, that's one of the first lines. So I eliminate D and E. Um, chronic neck pain, something chronic, maybe a muscle strain. Um, who knows? And then hamstring strain, I think stretching is good for. So that kind of eliminates A, B, and E. And then I just pick between B and C. That's 50 50. It's a lot better than, you know, 20%. Um, and then in the, we can do the next slide. In the explanation, it just, it just mentioned that um, for joint contractures, uh, usually the stretching doesn't, doesn't help with the contracture. So number two is kind of a longer one. Uh, I'll go ahead and read through it. Um, I'll read through it how I guess I would read through a regular question, uh, which is just not reading everything, but reading mostly the keywords. So it's a 23 year old female. Uh, she has lower abdominal and pelvic pain, vaginal discharge, uh, bleeding after sex, her pain worsens during sex. And then uh, she also has nausea, vomiting. Um, uh, exam, she has fever, cervical motion, tenderness, uh, axial, ax, uh, and axial tenderness without a mass, and then also a bunch of discharge. Labs show e uh, increased ESR, increased white counts. Hmm, what does she have? Maybe an infection. I don't know. Um, yeah, they have a bunch of WBCs, but uh, they kind of eliminate some of the diagnoses here for you. No BB, no TB. You order uh, NAAT for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Uh, but it seems those haven't come back yet. So which, what do you do at this point? And there's a, this is like a management question. There's a lot of management questions. You'll see patients like this in clinic and the hospital. So I'll give you guys a second. This is kind of a longer one. Okay, basically it's a young woman, she comes in, um, seems like an STI or something. The, the key word here, you can, you know, anybody can have nausea, vomiting, it could be like appendicitis or whatever, but the key word for me here is cervical motion tenderness and that tells me pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, so for that, I know for our clinic, for, um, for our OB, we just treat it immediately. Uh, you don't want any sort of, especially she, she's so young, she probably wants to have kids or she doesn't, you don't want any sort of cervical scarring or anything like that. So you would treat it immediately or treat it based on clinical findings with antibiotics. You wouldn't wait for the test. You wouldn't get imaging um, and you wouldn't do surgery. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully kind of this process of going through, you know, how to read, how to answer is helpful. Okay. And then we can do our last question. Okay. Which of these um, is associated with the use of stimulant medications? So I'll give you guys uh, 
just a few seconds for this one. This is another short one. Again, all of these are the free ones uh, for AFP. So if you like these, if you like the format of these, you can go ahead and get started. Get started with these, and um, you know, get on the road to mastery of the IT and the boards. So yeah, this question to me is asking uh, the side effects of stimulants. Um, so the way I think about it kind of is, uh, you know, I'm taking a medicine that kind of like hypes me up. So what can it do? Uh, is it going to cause weight gain? Uh, let's go just go through A to E. Um, is it going to be lower success? Well, I know that the use of stimulants for ADHD is uh, a first line drug. So if it, I, it doesn't seem like it would be lower success. Weight gain, let's say I'm not sure about that one. Um, a low risk of medication abuse. Well, I also know that in my residency, we're not allowed to prescribe these medicines. Uh, we have to get our attending to sign off on them. It's not like lisinopril or an antibiotic. So um, they're probably, that says to me, there probably is some risk for abuse and that's why it's a controlled substance. Um, and then it's a pretty common, again, it's first line therapy. So it's a pretty common drug. So if it had, seri if it had like a side effect of serious um, cardiovascular, effects, uh, you know, I don't think it would be as common of a drug. So that kind of knocks out three of these. Um, and if it's, if I'm taking this medicine to stimulate me, uh, I think in my head, it makes sense to, that it would increase my heart rate, increase my blood pressure. So I would go ahead and pick E. Um, and then we can go to the explanation. And there you are. Now, of course, I'm biased. I picked these answers. So I know the answer choices, but um, just having that kind of line of thoughts and reasoning through it um, in practice will definitely help you on your exam. Uh, because again, it's so broad that you're not going to know the answer to every single one, but eliminating choices and getting like getting it down to two is way better than having four or five answers to choose from. Yeah. I, I like that advice a lot by, you know, cause again, you may have a lot of different answer choices to choose from, but trying to whittle them down to as little as possible obviously increases your odds of getting the right answer. So um, I'll go through some of the, the internal medicine ones. Uh, I feel like internal medicine, there, there are very few short questions, unfortunately. Usually they're a little bit of a, a, little bit of a tome to read through. But uh, so here we have a 65 year old gentleman. He's coming in, he has a history of CAD complicated by ischemic cardiomyopathy, hospitalized for a two week history of progressive exertional dyspnea. He's noted worsening lower extremity edema and is needed to sleep in a recliner for the past week. His medications include low dose, I should say aspirin, furosemide, Simvastat, Gravedolol, Zinipril, Dijoxin, and as needed, metolazone. Physical exams, afebrile, blood pressure is 84 over 72, pulse is 120 and regular, uh, his O2 sat is 94% on ambient air, he's confused, there's JVD present, there's an S3 gallop on cardiac exam, uh, there's ascites on the exam, uh, two plus pitting edema to the knees bilaterally, his extremities are cool, his labs are notable for creatinine of 2.3, AST, ALT, well, with a baseline of normal, he's got an elevate, elevated transaminases, sodium of 130, his dig level is normal, um, EKG is not ischemic and unchanged from baseline. Uh, the TTE shows an EF of 20%. So which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Increasing his core egg, increasing the digoxin, increasing lisinopril or start dobutamine. So this is a management question and you'll see these a lot um, with, uh, with the uh, ITE for internal medicine as well as the ABIM. So, you know, what I usually do is walk through uh, my students with these kind of questions is, you know, try to differentiate, is this patient sick or not sick? Because that'll really get you to the, to the point of what are we going to do for this patient? So this patient has the telltale signs of heart failure uh, and not only heart failure, but, uh, but cardiogenic shock, right? They're hypotensive. They've got uh, cool extremities. They've got evidence of end organ damage. So, you know, they've got an AKI, transaminitis, they're hypometremic. So what are we going to do for this patient? Well, really the only thing to do for a patient in cardiogenic shock is to start them on inotrope. So dobutamine is really the only appropriate answer. Giving carvedilol, you know, negative inotrope in someone with cardiogenic shock is contraindicated. Uh, Dijoxin is, you know, has some inotropic properties, but it's not going to be enough to get this patient where they need to be. And lisinopril, uh, obviously increasing lisinopril in someone with an acute kidney injury is contraindicated. So the answer here would be D, start dobutamine. And this is sort of just the explanation that I just went through. So next we have an 85-year-old man in the ED for confusion, fevers and rigors for two days duration. 
Medical history is notable for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and BPH. Medications include lisinopril, HCTZ, and tamsulosin, and aspirin. He is febrile to 39.1. His BP is 102 over 70. His heart rate is 90, setting 95% on air. Urinary bladder is distended on exam. He's confused, but he has a non focal nerve exam. He's got uh, an, a leukocytosis. He's got uh, an elevated creatinine. Uh, an inflammatory urinalysis, blood and urine cultures are sent, his chest x-ray is normal. So which of the following, again, is the most appropriate next step management? So you have a couple of different ones. I'll let you guys sort of think through this. Uh, but again, it's just sort of going through this question and saying, well, what am I going to do for this particular patient? Sometimes what I tell people to do is sort of read the question first and scan through the answer choices to sort of frame the question for you. Is it a management question? Is it a diagnosis question? Is it an ethics question? Um, you know, by just looking at this, I see a whole list of antibiotics. So it's already framing in my mind, it's gonna be a treatment question and I'm gonna be treating an infection. So I can already approach the question with that in mind. So this is an elderly gentleman coming in with sepsis secondary to a urinary source given his inflammatory UA, he's got an elevated white count, he's febrile. Um, so I know I'm already dealing with a gentleman who has a uh, sep uh, septic-like picture from a urinary source. I know it's a man, so that also helps because a man and a urinary tract infection is already a compli uh, complicated UTI by definition. So I'm looking at the answer choices and I have IV cefepime and a renal ultrasound, IV Cipro, IV levofloxacin and a digital prostate massage, uh, or IV piptazo and a contrast enhanced abdominal pelvic CT. So with, with a patient like this, an elderly gentleman, I want to give him antibiotics, obviously, and that doesn't help with the answer choices because there's an antibiotic for every choice. But I want to get an idea of his genital urinary anatomy as well, um, especially given his AKI and everything. I want to make sure he doesn't have any sort of urinary obstruction. He's got BPH. So that would help because that would also aid in management. So I can sort of get rid of just ciprofloxacin alone because that's not going to help. Um, and a digital prostate massage has really helped no one. You know, if you do a, if you do a rectal exam, you can help if you, if you feel a tender, boggy prostate, that might help you in the diagnosis of prostatitis. But a digital prostate massage or prostate milking actually increases the risk of bacteremia and actually has a low diagnostic yield. And the thing with IV fluoroquinolones as well, like Cipro and levofloxacin, uh, there's a lot of resistance uh, to those antibiotics, to fluoroquinolone antibiotics. So we typically don't use them as first line empiric therapy for septic patients in the, uh, in the hospital. So then we're left with A and D, cefepime and piperacil and tazobactam both have really good pseudomonal coverage as well as RAM negative coverage, which would be an excellent option for this gentleman. However, we have now two imaging options to choose from, a renal ultrasound or a CT out of the pelvis that's, contra that's contrast in pants. So both of those would be great to look at the genital urinary tract. In fact, the CAT scan would probably be a little bit better, but he's got an AKI, so we can't give him contrast. So that eliminates D. So we're left with answer choice A. Um, you give him a broad spectrum antibiotic and you get an, you get a, 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 an imaging of his genital urinary system, which will obviously... The, the choice will depend upon his um, his comorbid conditions. So this is what they'll do a lot for medicine is they'll sort of give you answer choices that are correct, right? D would be an appropriate answer, but the patient himself has a contraindication. So they'll do that because that that's what makes this question tricky, right? Because Zosin is, and Piptazo is a great antibiotic. A, a CAT scan of the belly and pelvis would be a great option. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be a great option for our patients. So you have to then go to the next one. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this slide just tells us a little bit more about us, what we do at Med School Tutors. Um, like I said, uh, we just like everybody else wants you to succeed. Um, you know, in talking with us, uh, you can have a one-on-one -on -one tutor such as Eric or myself uh, or someone else who's very experienced. Um, we would help you if you need it, uh, make a custom schedule, a realistic schedule um, that's tailored to your goals. Uh, we would work with you on strength, weaknesses, uh, and progression down the timeline uh, towards your board exam. Uh, we also have adapted to during sessions, so it's not like, oh, every Tuesday we need to meet, only if that's what you want. Um, I know our schedules are very flexible um, in terms of meeting in the afternoon, weekends, things like that. Uh, there's regular communications. I know I often text a lot of my a lot of my students. Um, things happen, life happens. So, oh, you know, I can't meet on Tuesday. Can we change it to Wednesday? 
no, that's not an issue or, hey, I think I'm actually doing pretty good with questions. Um, maybe can we meet in two weeks? Uh, that's all fine. And it's not just with uh, your test. We also do kind of counseling, mentorship and guidance uh, in regards to from med school to residency, from med, uh, residency to uh, the next step, finding a job, things like that. Yeah, and I, I think Mike hit the nail on the head there. You know, we know you guys are super busy with residency, um, especially with my with my students who I tutor for the ABIM and for ITE. I'm I'm very flexible. So if something comes up, like hey, you know, I thought I was going to get out at five o'clock, but guess what? I'm still in the hospital. I, I'm not going to be able to make it to the session. I, again, I, I I totally get it. I wasn't a resident that long ago, so I totally understand. I work with residents every day. I know how busy you guys are, so I'm totally empathetic to your plight of of residency. So. We, we understand that and we're adaptable and we help you, again, stay on track. And then that, that regular communication between sessions, I check in on my students just to see how they're doing, especially if I know they're on like a rough rotation, like if they're on the ICU, if there's anything, you know, I could do to help with their, with their studying or their prep, I'm totally for it. So with that being said, uh, we're here to, to take your questions. If you have any questions to send in via the, the chat. And I think the the biggest thing uh, when you're studying for these exams in residency is to to pace yourself and to sort of be forgiving of yourself and to sort of set those expectations, like we said, because it's it's impossible if you go in with this mindset that you have to, you have to do you know finish all of U World in in you know in the month or you know in the in the two month period, um, or if you expect that you know you're gonna after a really busy day you're also gonna spend three hours studying. You're just going to set yourself up for disappointment. And then again, like Mike was saying, like that disappointment sort of feeds into your overall perception of how you are as a test taker. And then it sort of just sets you back. So I think having those realistic expectations saying like, yeah, I'm totally, you know, I'm in an ICU month this month. It's going to, it's going to be a rough time to study. Whatever studying I get is going to be a win. That's what I do. It's like, if I got any studying done, I congratulated myself at the end of the day and said, Hey, you know what? I did three mix out questions. That's a win for me especially because I admitted like four patients overnight, I'm exhausted. Yeah, for sure. For sure. There are those hard months. And also, if you think about it, if you, you don't have to know everything, you don't have to get a hundred or the perfect score on the exam. You need to pass. Yeah. Uh, and for us, um, it doesn't matter too much for like fellowship. And, uh, you know, I interviewed for a lot of jobs, like attending jobs and nobody asks what you got on your board exam. They don't even know what it is, you know, and they're just, are you yeah. board certified? Yes or no. And as long as you pass, you are board certified. So, yeah. And even when you're applying for internal medicine, it's, it's even better because when you're applying, you just have to be board eligible, which is be a yeah. resident. Uh, so, cause you're, you haven't even taken your, your, your board. So obviously you, you need to pass them, but, but all you need to do is pass them. Um, and I think the ITEs again, really low, low stress. Um, I feel like a lot of people freak out about their ITEs. I, I just use it as like, Hey, this is just, a random practice test that I, I get I get the day off to take uh, and you know you get coverage as at least in my residency program I got coverage for the day took my ITE um, you know didn't like it because it was rough uh, but then I got my score back a few weeks later and was able to like have a physical printout of how I did and say okay cool this is what I'm going to use to for mix app I'm going to like use this in my mind to sort of sketch out a study plan. Yeah it really it's the best resource and it's free I mean yeah. you can't you can't ask for more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, you know, Mike and I'll just keep going back and forth with our own little anecdotes about residency. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you'll get you'll get tired of hearing from us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now yeah, what else? I think, yeah, really, if you do, if you learn like one thing, that's one more thing like that, you know, that you didn't know yesterday, you know? So. Yeah. yeah. And I like, and just to show you, like, I, I'm kind of a really big fan from MixApp. I use it still to this very day, especially when I'm on the teaching services and I sort of cheat. I, I, I like scroll the list from home and I say, okay, well, they, they admitted uh, a cirrhotic patient overnight. So I'm just going to read the MixApp chapter on cirrhosis to see if I can like bring up any teaching pearls. And even MixApp will sometimes even bring up papers, like, uh, you know, seminal papers that I can be like, oh, good. I'll just like, I'll go on PubMed and look up this paper. It'll look like I'm like the attending who knows everything about cirrhosis. Uh, when in fact, I sort of just like spent the subway ride reading about it uh, and brushing up on it. But again, it's, it's a really, it's a really good resource. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, 
hopefully, you know, you guys like what you saw and, you know, want to, want to join us for tutoring. Um, you know, Mike and I would be happy to help and any way possible. So, uh, our emails were on the, the front, uh, slide. So feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions.